Hi there, I'm Ken Reed, Sportsnet anchor, collector, and author of Hockey Card Stories. The 2015-16 NHL season has an added amount of hype surrounding it, and it's pretty clear why. Fans are enjoying great hockey and watching future stars like Connor McDavid and Jack Eichel start their NHL journey, while another industry and its fans are getting equally as excited. That industry is the multi-million dollar world of hockey cards. Not since the low to 2005-06 season when Sidney Crosby and Alex Ovechkin entered the league has there been so much buzz over rookie cards and the hobby of collecting. People will be flocking by the masses to their local card or online shops to put down big money to buy packs, boxes or even cases to get these memorable and valuable pieces of hockey memorabilia. Although hockey cards are not as popular as the other major sports cards, they still have a long and rich history behind them, one that I'd like to quickly share with you, at least the first 80 years or so of it. We start in 1910, when Imperial Tobacco decided to accompany their products with the likeness of players from the new National Hockey Association, predating the NHL. Stars like Art Ross were featured in that first C-56 set, with famed goalie George Vesna coming in the following year's set. The cards not only added incentive to buy Imperial Tobacco products, they also shone a light on the stars of the new growing game of hockey. In the Roaring Twenties, there was a shift from cards and tobacco products to candy and chocolate. Although there were several companies releasing hockey cards, there is a single card that stands out from the rest, the Burt Corbo 1923 V145-1 from William Patterson is one of the most sought after for its rarity, partly caused by the fact that the chocolate company purposely printed fewer of them to ensure that kids wouldn't be able to follow through with the redemption promo they offered. Due to world events, the 30s and 40s saw fewer cards being released, but thanks to cards being available in one cent packs of gum for Bopeechee, as opposed to five cent chocolate or candy bars, collecting didn't go away. Stars like Toe Blake helped with the growth of hockey and kids could send wrappers and labels from items like Beehive Golden Corn Syrup, Kellogg's or Quaker Oats to receive an oversized card or picture of a player they wanted. The 50s are when hockey cards really developed an identity, when a Canadian confectionery company called Parkhurst released a set of cards known as the Parkies 1951-52 set. Given the lack of production in the previous years, the set featured many players' first ever cards. Maurice Richard, Gordy Howe, Elmer Locke, and many more have their rookie cards here. In the mid-50s, Topps joined the market with a set of their own and would end up releasing one of the biggest cards of the 1960s. Companies saw the popularity of cards in helping soft products. Coca-Cola got in on the action with booklets of players in the 60s, but cards were now their own entity. And Topps proved that with their 1966-67 set featuring a young and highly skilled rookie by the name of Bobby Orr. Orr would help the popularity of the hobby in America, leading to Topps releasing exclusive sets for the USA. In top condition, Orr's rookie card is worth thousands and is the jewel of many collections. Topps and Opeechee sat atop the hockey card game in the 70s and offered similar and sometimes parallel sets with different designs. The NHL's audience and the league itself was getting bigger, and hockey cards had a devout following. People bought cards, hoping to get rookies of players like Guy Lafleur, Marcel Dion, and Mike Bossy, among many others. But no rookie card is more collected than one from the 79-80 sets. Wayne Gretzky's rookie card is among the most dreamed about, purchased, sold, and forged in hockey card history. It was made by Alpici and Topps, with the former being worth more, fetching thousands of dollars depending on the condition. The 80s were a popular decade as well. Tops and Opeechee were still highly desirable, and kids wanted their favorite players from the 80-81 set, rookies like Ray Bork and Marc Messier. Many other future Hall of Famers debuted in the 80s as well. Paul Coffey, Steve Eiserman, Mario Lemieux, and Patrick Waugh as the decade went on. Then came the late 80s and early 90s, where the game of hockey grew to immense popularity, and so did hockey card collecting. That meant the release of more sets from new companies trying to quench the thirst of collectors. So cards became overproduced, more expensive, and were offered with more variety than ever. The market had become flooded, and after 80 years, some of the recent productions were essentially, well, not worth a ton. Kids still collected their favorite players, but what followed were dark years and an eventual rebirth. Another part of hockey card history for another day.